Hello, everybody. My name is Natalie Gonche, and welcome to the November webinar of the Applied Evolutionary Epistemology Lab. Today is a celebration because we are celebrating and actually ahead of uh, print and ahead of the final, uh, uh, in, ahead of all papers being in, we are celebrating uh, the publication of a special issue on language and worldviews that is going to be published in the Journal of uh, Topoi. And so that uh, a special issue is uh, an outgrowth of uh, Protolang 2019 that was organized by uh, me and other people here in Lisbon uh, at the Hulbenken Foundation. And uh, we made a satellite event there, uh, which was held at the Faculty of Science of the University of Lisbon on language throughout the ages. Because I'm very interested in language evolution, I'm a philosopher of science and uh, also an anthropologist. And for me, language evolution, the field of language evolution is one of my uh, areas where I do the field research in a way. They, they, they are uh, my, my, guinea pigs, my, my guinea pigs in a way. This is where I, um, uh, this is one of the fields that I used to think about uh, evolution. And so I'm very interested in language. I'm very interested in language evolution. And my PhD was actually about how you can apply evolutionary biology to the study of language. But of course, language, is a very important topic uh, within philosophy of science and also within philosophy in general. And so that satellite event then was uh, about how language is defined over the ages by different fields within philosophy, anthropology, um, linguistics, religious studies as well. And so I organized that uh, uh, workshop together with uh, uh, Marta Facuti, who was uh, a collaborator of mine here uh, uh, in Lisbon. And um, then we decided to do a special issue and uh, Martha could not join us, but then uh, Diana, who was speaking at the uh, uh, workshop, Diana Kuto from uh, MLAG uh, from uh, Porto, from the University of Porto, she joined us uh, in the editing. And then also Lorenzo Magnani joined us in the editing and Selena Arfini, who is the student of Lorenzo, joined us uh, in the meeting. Barbara spoke at the meeting, and uh, she won the prize of the best presentation uh, of the postdoctoral uh, uh, speakers at that meeting. Uh, and she wrote a paper for the special issue. And then we also have Mathieu Fontaine, who used to be a, a collaborator of the Center for Philosophy. He's still a collaborator of the Center for Philosophy of Science, but he also used to work there. But he has since moved uh, on to a professorship in um, uh, Spain. And so he joined us also in the editing. And so uh, all of us have been editing for about two years, this special issue on language and worldviews for Topoi. And uh, last, uh, the last webinar that we had, we also already had uh, uh, Sofia Mijens from the University of Porto, who was um, uh, one of the, the collaborators uh, for, the, for, the, uh, 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 for the journal. Uh, I'm sorry, because there was some nice, yeah. And so uh, Sofia has uh, written in that and then all the people that participated in the in the workshop. And then we also have some uh, people that responded to our call, our call for abstracts. And so um, Fabio, uh, the editor in chief of the journal of Topoi um, uh, wanted to join us today, but he was unable to. Um, because he wanted to do the, we, we, we asked him to do the introduction and he was very happy to do so, but he was unable, he had a, another commitment, but he shared with us a slide and I'm going to share my screen with you and read that slide for you. Uh, you can see that, right? Okay, so uh, here he says, dear all, I deeply regret being unable to join your webinar. Uh, due to a former commitment. Nonetheless, I'm happy to take the opportunity to congratulate the guest editors of the upcoming Topoi issue on language and worldviews, Natalie Gontir, Diana Cuto, Lorenzo Magnani, Selene Arfini, and Mathieu Fontaine. They are putting together an impressive collection of papers on this topic, which should be completed by the end of this month or so. I also wish to express my gratitude to all the authors, some of whom are present here today, since the quality of this issue is, as always, mostly their doing. I, for one, look forward to seeing this volume published in print, uh, and I am sure today's webinar will offer to all participants a juicy morsel of what is to come out soon enough in the journal. Thus, I do not want to keep you from it any longer, and I wish you a productive and lively discussion, and I send you my best greetings from Rome. Fabio, who is the editor-in-chief uh, of uh, Topoi. Thank you very much, Fabio. 
It is very much appreciated. And so uh, without further ado, so we have three speakers today. We have Lorenzo Magnani, Selene Arfini, and uh, Barbara Jimenez Pazos. And so Lorenzo is a professor of philosophy of science and the coordinator of graduate and postgraduate students in uh, philosophy at the University of Pavia in Italy. He's the director of the Computational Philosophy Laboratory and also the editor-in-chief of the Springer book series, Sapere, Studies in Applied Philosophy, Epistemology and Rational Ethics. He just recently published a new book on eco-cognitive computationalism, cognitive domestication of ignorant entities. He's a member of the Academy Internationale de Philosophie des Sciences, and he's also chair of the MBR International Conference Series on Model-Based Reasoning in Science and Technology. I'm very happy that he is here today uh, uh, opening the webinar and that he uh, uh, collaborated on the special issue. It was truly an honor to, to work with you and, and it was a very nice collaboration. I'm very happy about that. And so Lorenzo, please uh, go ahead. Ah, wait, I have to uh, unmute you. Uh, yeah. Yes. We can hear you. Are you able to see my presentation? Yes, we can, we can. It is opening very nicely. Perfect. So, as you can see, uh, I am engaged in this presentation in speaking about cognitive Nietzsche, Nietzsche construction and moral bubbles. So, to explain in a better way uh, the aim of my presentation, I have to say that um, the target is uh, naturalizing the problem of morality, because we will deal with collective and individual aspects of morality uh, intertwined, okay? So to this aim, we have to deal with the concept of cognitive niches, that is a collective, of course, as you can imagine, and the related concept of moral niches, niches, the concept of moral bubbles, and we will see the problem in this perspective, the problem of the social survival of morality, that it is important important uh, from many perspectives, as you all know. So, cognitive niche construction. The theory of cognitive niches describes, describes the environment as a sort of global market that provides living creature with unlimited possibilities. Indeed, not all the possibilities that the environment offers can be exploited by the human and non-human animals that act on it. For example, as you all know, the environment provides organisms with water to swim in, air to fly in, flat surfaces to walk on, and so on. However, no creatures are fully able to take advantage of all of them. Through the activity of niche construction, all organisms try to modify their surroundings. Of course, uh, human beings are extremely, extremely efficient in this modification in order to better exploit those elements that suit them and eliminate or mitigate the effect of the negative ones. This activity is highly related to the hypothetical virtues provided by abductive cognition. Why? Because you all know 
that abductive cognition, human abductive cognition is related to the generation of hypotheses and also of new uh, hypotheses. In this case, we, uh, we deal with uh, creative abduction. And so it is this kind of creativity that make the human beings able to uh, find good hypotheses and so to uh, perform consequent actions that uh, can modify the, envi the environment. Okay, so two images of a natural environment and of a cognitive niche. And what about the relationship between Darwinian selection and action and cognitive niches? Relevant aspects of the environment are appropriately abductively selected and unreconstructed so as to turn the local environment inert from a cognitive point of view into a cultural mediating structure able to deliver suitable chances for behavior control. Through cognitive uh, niche construction, organizers not only influence the nature of the of the world, but also in part determine the Darwinian selection pressure to which their and their descendants are exposed. And of course, the selection pressures to which other species are subjected. Of course, uh, as you all know, uh, we continually to modify the environment. Imagine, for example, that human beings invented language, language, uh, syntactic language, that uh, was also one of the topics of the, of the special issue of the journal. And language is written. In this case, when we write linguistic sentences in, uh, in the external environment, we transform the external environment in a co cognitive niche. Okay, so other examples of cognitive niches, you see these, uh, of course, have uh, drawings of our ancestors and other examples also taken from animals, because also animals, if we agree with the image of uh, uh, animals as related to animal cognition, are builder of cognitive niches. So of course, they are not comparable to the cognitive niches of human being. Odlings me, Odlings me and co-author say niche construction should be regarded after natural selection as a second major participant in evolution. Niche construction is a potent evolutionary agent because it introduces feedback into the evolutionary dynamics. By a cognitive niche, I mean an anim we can mean an animal built physical structure, for instance, a drawing, a written text in a sheet of paper or in a laptop. Uh, the physical structure that transforms one or more problem spaces in ways that, when successful, aid thinking and reasoning about some target domain or domains. These physical structures combined with, uh, combined with appropriate cultural transmitted practice to enhance problem solving, and of course, in the most dramatic cases, to make possible all new forms of thought and reason. As an example, I remember to you that in many cases of the history of scientific discoveries, scientists took advantage of sketches, drawing, but also of artifacts 
artifacts. They built artifacts, for example, Maxwell is fam uh, um, uh, Ampere is famous for having uh, um, created artifacts to try to manipulate cognitively the world, uh, the external world, to arrive to some new hypothesis. I quoted Maxwell, Maxwell and Faraday are famous for having exploited uh, as, a, as fragments of cognitive niches, very important drawings. So in the external environment and then reprojected internally in their minds to the aim of funding something. To this, um, in this case, I also, proposed the, the concept of manipulative abduction in my books on abduction. The last one um, uh, was entitled uh, uh, the, the Role of Abduction. I, I don't remember exactly the, 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 um, the title, Creativity, uh, the Abduct Creativity in Scientific Reasoning. Uh, manipulative abduction is when you modify the environment to you build fragment of cognitive niches to help your hypothetical reasoning. So, other cognitive niches in a scientific laboratory, a building with some status and to conclude the part about cognitive niches, we can say that uh, uh, we face uh, an ecological inheritance, not only general inheritance, that is natural selection among organisms, influences which uh, you all know, individuals will survive to pass on their genes to the next generation. That is usually regarded as the only inheritance system to play a fundamental role in biological evolution. Nevertheless, where niche construction plays a role in various generations, this introduces a second general inheritance system, also called ecological inheritance by Odlings, me and colleagues, for instance, Laland and other. The first system, of course, once through the process of reproduction, sexual, for example, during the life of organism. On the contrary, the second can, in principle, be informed, performed by any organism towards any other organism, ecological, but not necessarily genetic relatives, at any stage during their lifetimes. Organisms adapt to their environments, but also adapt to environments reconstructed by them or other organism. From this perspective, acquired characteristics can play a role in the evolutionary process. Can play a role, of course, even if in a non-Lamarckian way, through their influence, their possible potential influence on selective environments via cognitive niche construction. This is why we can say that the theory of cognitive niches, the uh, performance of humans that build cognitive niches introduces what I call a sense of purposefulness in evolution. So we, uh, we have also an image to celebrate uh, Charles Darwin, as you can see, but now we have to abandon the cognitive niches, and we have to, 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 to zoom in a particular uh, kind of cognitive, of human cognitive niche, of, of human cognitive niches. That is the so-called moral niches. For example, a church, for example, a text that contains linguistic, moral rules, 
drawings, uh, images, religious also images, because you know that religion always carries uh, moral aspects. You, we have to uh, stress that moral niches grant cooperation, but also punishment, because you know that when you want that in a collective, uh, some, for example, free risers do not follow the estab established moral rules, you have to punish them because uh, <clears throat> they put in danger the cooperation granted by <clears throat> the moral niches. Okay, so let's see what we can say. It was important to clarify the concept of cognitive niche, that is at the base basis of the possibility to grasp human moral and axiological systems in a naturalistic way. So avoiding the analytic and abstractness of moral philosophy that I do not like a lot, I have to say. I respect moral philosophy, of course, but I do not like a lot uh, seeing morality in that analytic way. And the intertwined violence, which in this perspective still appears in all of its banality. You know that banality is a word of Anna Arendt. Uh, I said violence because when you have to punish a person in a collective, this person can feel that punishment, a violent punishment. You know that there are many violent punishment from the moral point of view. Also, no, the electric chair is a kind of violent punishment that is also performed by the state. So what are moral niches? For example, text full of language, artifacts, for instance, the cross in Christian, religion, Christian tradition, buildings, endowed with it, and many, many other uh, uh, entities, endowed with ethical worth. Our objectified moral conditions are, in general, very stable. But at the same time, they are also vulnerable and modifiable so that it is easy to see in a human individual the stability of moral conviction depending on his stable moral niches together with another aspect. For instance, uh, a human being can follow the moral rules embedded in, in Catholic tradition. I am in Italy, so I have to, to speak about Catholic tradition, but also there is the spontaneous attitude to disengage rules and to adopt other rules uh, that are different from the ones that you engage in a moment. For instance, in a moment you are following a Catholic rules and then after a few minutes you will follow the rules, uh, the moral rules that are embedded in the laws of the state that maybe are different. Abortion is permitted in Italy, but it is not permitted from the Catholic point of view. So, uh, which, for example, are not dominant in his present moral cognitive niche, but still present as vestigial traces of previous, no longer dominant moral cognitive niches. Imagine, for instance, that human beings often uh, are engaged in uh, the activity of scapegoating. That is an ancient way. Okay, moral niches grant collectivity, coalition enforcement in collectives and cooperation. So what is the moral bubble? A cognitive adjective is very likely, we have to deal with the moral bubble to arrive the, with the, the cognitive uh, epistemic bubble to arrive to the moral bubble. A cognitive agent is very likely, likely to take any kind of belief for knowledge. 
Okay, so we, we believe but at the same time, we think that we know. This is not always true. Furthermore, Woods argues that belief can only coincide with the first person attribution of knowledge because from the third person perspective, you just believe something, but you do not know in many cases. The concept of epistemic cognitive bubble points out how even thought the satisfaction of uh, a cognitive quest is met by a positive final emotional appraisal. Uh, such a positive appraisal is hardly a symptomatic sign of the proper attainment of the target. Okay, imagine this uh, uh, abductive reasoning. First premise, if I know target P, uh, then my irritation about P is relieved. Uh, second premise, my irritation about P is relieved, so I know target P. So the so-called, see the last line of the slide, epistemic or cognitive bubble is related to the fact that you believe something, but you are inside this bubble of the image in which you are not able to detect the fact that you in reality believe, only believe, but you do not know. So, of course, from this point of view, belief immunizes. Belief immunizes the agent from distinguishing what she knows and what she just believes she knows. The state of belief is both the condition of knowledge and an impediment of its attainment. So the epistemic cognitive uh, 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 is a first person knowledge ascription, not uh, uh, subjective, performed by the knowing agent to move the difference between knowing knowing sub, something and thinking she knows that, some, that that same thing is unappearant. Okay, so it is a, a kind of immunization, the epistemic or also called cognitive bubble. In this case, epistemic is a, a word intended in a wide sense. Uh, there is this tradition of intending epistemic in a wide sense, in a wide sense that I do not like a lot because I prefer to use the objective epistemic only related uh, to science. But anyway, epistemic bubble in the sense of cognitive bubble. You see that in this case, we are immunized to uh, detect that we do not know uh, of course, we, in this case, uh, we are in a, in a period very full of uh, potential uh, or expected uh, immunizations. It is not the immunization of, from coronavirus, but from knowledge, okay? Uh, I have to say that in, in this era of uh, coronavirus, uh, there are also many immunization uh, in, in, uh, with respect to, 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 to knowledge and truth, because we assisted, we attended, and as, uh, we faced a lot of confusions. Let's go ahead. Okay, what are moral bubbles? In this case, exactly as in the case of uh, epistemic cognitive bubbles, you see that differently with respect to uh, the problem of moral niches, cognitive niches, that was related to a collective situation, to an, a collective, uh, to an, an individual, but then collective externalization of law, of, of knowledge, of information, of morality that become, obje become objective and stable. In this case, we are, as in the case of epistemic cognitive bubbles, related to individuals, the moral and 
bubble is homomorphic to the epistemic one or cognitive, cognitive and bubble. It is the result of impossibility of knowledge as relevant case making and the result of a strategic cognitive need to reduce doubt and uncertainty as much as, much as possible. Do you remember I just said that cognitive epistemic bubble is related to uh, reduced doubt? So I, I believe, I know, okay. It is, it is important, uh, you know, to, to stay well also, to be satisfied also from the emo emotional point of view. Being constitutively and easily unaware of our errors is very often bound with the self-conviction that we are not at all deceptive, aggressive in our performed argumentations and action. Why? Because we only know that they are moral. And when we act morally, this moral bubble grants almost always, but even not necessarily always, grant the fact that we are not aware of the, of the potential violence, aggressivity, uh, that we inflict to other human beings. So this is the moral bubble. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. No. Wait a moment, because I, I still have to the last uh, uh, the last slide. Okay. So this is the book in which there are these things. This is the last slide. The last slide: the social survival of morality. After all, when we act morally, we want to believe we are acting in a non-violent way a priori. And we want to preserve the moral bubble we are in, which permits us to erase the possible violence, punishment, for example. Some punishments are very violent, aggressive. We are dealing with, in this perspective, morality is strictly intertwined with violence. Finally, I will contend, I contend that the moral bubble is also a necessary condition to the social survival of morality and so of the moral niches. Its scope is to avoid the cognitive breakdown that would be triggered by the constant appraisal of the major or minor inconsistency of our conduct with respect to our convictions. Here, this is at the final uh, slide. I stayed in, in, half, in half an hour, it seems to me. Uh, yes, yes, it, Lorenzo, but sorry to it, interrupt you, but you switch slides and you are no longer sharing screen. Oh, really? Can please, uh, yes, can you please share your screen again? Thank you. Oh, really? I'm sorry. Please. No, it's okay, it's okay. Wait a moment. Condivide yeah. schermo. So you lost uh, the last slide, I guess. You did, you did, yeah. Yes, yes, the last slide. The last one, yeah. Yeah. I'm very sorry because this. Uh... Okay. okay, so the last slide after the one related to moral bubbles was related to the social survival of morality. Because, of course, the moral bubble is important because and it is, necessary, is a necessary condition to the social survival of morality itself. Its scope is to avoid the cognitive breakdown that will be triggered by the constant appraisal of the major or minor inconsistency of our conduct with respect to our conclusion. If we would feel, then when we inflict punishment to uh, protect moral rules that we share, if we will be aware always of the violence inflicted, uh, this, will, this will jeopardize 
the morality, the moral views. So this, to conclude, the social survival of morality is, uh, uh, is due, is granted by uh, the moral bubble. And to conclude, this is a quotation uh, of, from Bertrand Russell that without civic morality, it, it is in some sense related to, to our presentation, not, not directly in the, indirectly. Without civic morality communities perish, okay. Without personal morality, their survival has no value. Okay, so the, the moral bubble that is not so nice because the moral bubble impede uh, in many cases to human beings to perceive they are violent. But indeed it is important because he grants the survival of morality and you see that morality, uh, as uh, also Bertrand Russell says, is important to grant cooperation to the survival of collectives, of community. And so he says, Bertrand Russell, that was not aware of the problem of the moral bubble and so on, without personal morality, without the survival of personal morality, um, of course, uh, the survival of uh, collective morality has no value. So thanks a lot for your attention. And uh, I'm sorry that the, the, the presentation dis disappear at a certain point. Okay. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. Don't worry about the slides. It, it was a bit of confusion. Thanks to, thanks to you and to the people that were uh, patient uh, to follow the presentation. Thanks. Thank you very much. Questions? Actually, I'm gonna take the opportunity to ask a first question because earlier this week I was in Porto and I was attending a, a seminar uh, about the conjunction between neuroscience and uh, architecture, which was very interesting. And, and uh, um, it was organized by Pedro from uh, uh, the University of Porto. And, um, a collaborator of Diana, Diana Kuta and Sofia Miens, who, who spoke in the last webinar. And the, the, the keynote was given by uh, Michael Arbib. And um, I asked him a question um, uh, which he was unable to answer. And perhaps you can <laughs> answer uh, the question uh, uh, for the both of us because he was talking about metaphors and um, how uh, metaphors enable creative thought and enable the, 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 cog the it lies at the basis also of cognitive niche construction. Um, and then I ask him the question, so if you look, for example, into the work of Lacov and Johnson and Turner uh, and, and this idea of, of, of uh, uh, metaphors, um, and how that underlies this reconstruction, how then does that relate with abduction? Is abduction also a metaphorical process in a way that underlies the creativity of thought? What is the relation between uh, metaphorical thinking and abduction? Okay, so uh, ab abduction, we can say that it is a, a more general word. And in this case, I follow Charles Sanders Peirce that consider abduction uh, a, a, in, in the case of human beings, a cognitive process to generate hypotheses. Of course, I, hypothesis that, that can be already known as in the case of diagnostic reasoning or new in the case of creative abduction. Okay, so two, from the, from the wide cognitive point of view to generate hypotheses uh, and so to perform abduct, abductive cognition, you can exploit a lot of, cognit, uh, of, co of cognitive tools. And among these tools, of course, analogy and metaphor is very important because 
if you find not a stupid analogy that is already known by all the human beings, but a good analogy, a new analogy, this can lead to, for instance, in the case of science, to scientific discovery. And analogy in abductive uh, cognition and abductive uh, creativity in this case is not only related to the action to the uh, efficiency of human syntactic languages or also even uh, also in the case they are complicated by symbolic languages such as mathematics statistic logic but also uh, visual analogies yeah. so uh, thought experiment in which there are embedded metaphors and analogies. Imagine that, for instance, in the case of the discovery of DNA and RNA, it was important for Watson and Crick uh, in their, uh, in their uh, cognitive process to see the image of two snakes, okay? that were uh, one inside the other. And so this was an analogy, an analogy absolutely visual without relationship with uh, human syntactic language. Uh, so analogy is certainly, to conclude my answer, uh, a trigger, an important trigger of novelties, of discovery. And uh, of course, as I, as I told you when I said, when I told you, my forthcoming book will be about uh, uh, the, 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 the title is Discoverability. The subtitle is The Urgent Need of an Ecology of Human Creativity. Okay, a human being to be creative, for instance, thanks to analogies and metaphors, has to be in a good, I, I call it eco-cognitive settings, in which there is a quantity of information of knowledge that can favor analogies. Okay, were I able to answer? Yeah. Are Thank there, you very much. There's a question of JT and of uh, Elena. JT, you go first. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lorenzo. I have two quick questions. Uh, I suppose you are familiar with Steven Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now, in which he argues there's an increase in moral progress of humanity over time. Um, would you agree that we have that empirical improvement in, in social moral progress in humanity, or are we still in, trapped inside our own moral bubble? Okay, so uh, uh, I partially agree with Pinker's ideas because uh, in, in, in my book about understanding violence, I have to say that, of course, I, I am indebted to a moral rules, and the moral rules is the respect of knowledge, okay? But I do not have other moral rules. So uh, uh, if I would believe in the moral progress, it is a kind of morality that I, I'm not interested uh, to share, at least when I, uh, when I am writing a book or an article. Then in, my, in the other parts of my, of my life, I can also follow this, uh, this kind of moral idea or also other religious moral ideas, moral convictions. But when you write a book, uh, at least the approach that I adopted to write that book, was a very naturalistic approach in which I wanted to see what happens and so do not adopt rules. In this case, si par valicet componere manis, in Latin, uh, imitating uh, uh, Immanuel Kant in uh, uh, famous articles 
with the title the, the, uh, La religione in tre confini della ragione, in English religion uh, in between the limitation of the reason, okay? So I'm not interested in, uh, in speaking about uh, the moral aspects of religion, but its structure, its qualities, recently cognitive science has made a lot of things, a lot of research to naturalize religion, to see the, the cognitive structure of, of religion, and that they are very, very interesting. For example, from the point of view of the relationship, the strict relationship between morality and religion, and also the relationship with violence, that there is not only religion, but also in the modern states, okay? The only other quick question I had was, I just put in the chat a link to an idea for a computer algorithm program that you have in your smartphone. As you're about to do anything, it checks the ethics so that if you're about to buy a product with palm oil, it will say, don't do that because an orangutan in Sumatra will not have a palm forest. Um, Anyone here, if you have any feedback on, on that idea, I have a chapter in my forthcoming book on an idea for this computer program to check the morals of the whole world at once using big data. I like your motto, knowledge as duty. <laughs> um, I think the more knowledge we have for our actions, we can check if they're more ethical or not. So yeah, sometime if anyone has any comments on, on this idea, I would love to hear them. Sorry, I better let Elena go now. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, yes, thank you. It is, it is good because, you know, there are other instruments uh, and uh, in the case they are able to increase knowledge about uh, events, situation, objects, morality can take advantage uh, from uh, knowledge because knowledge is a duty. Why? Why? Not because I like knowledge or my salary. My salary derives from knowledge, okay, because I am a university professor. But because everywhere it is full of knowledge everywhere and especially of technological artifacts and to deal with technological artifacts is necessary to have to, to possess the uh, appropriate knowledge. And in, in this case, it is an, an app that is related to um, uh, promote other kinds of knowledge to increase ethical knowledge and so ethical awareness. Thank you. Elena, please. Yeah, dear Lorenzo, thank you for, for your talk. Uh, I'm interested in um, niche construction theory, so my question will be what about it. Uh, you mentioned it, uh, works of um, Odling, Odling Smith, who initiated uh, the usage of uh, niche construction theory in uh, cultural and social studies. And uh, now there are a lot of philosophical debate uh, about this, this uh, niche construction theory. So uh, the main question, whether uh, niche construction uh, has a sufficient potential to, ex uh, to explain uh, biological process as well as uh, social and cultural process, or whether it's just a metaphor like Natalie says, uh, and uh, it has no heuristic potential, uh, just uh, some fashionable fear and nothing more. How can you evaluate it? Okay, so my opinion in this case is, First of all, that the cognitive niche construction, the, con the theory of cognitive niches, is an interesting and good extension of the Darwinian frameworks, framework because it is able quickly and uh, neatly to describe that in some cases, uh, the modification of the environment can modify the selective pressures. That, what, that is what I said. This introduces a kind of a sense of purposefulness in evolution because it is the action of human beings that can modify selective pressures, not only in the case of human beings, but also in the case of other animals and so on. 
So from this point of view, it is very clear, in my own opinion, the theory of cognitive um, niches. It is also clear if related to the recent, recent tradition of distributed cognition, because is able to uh, show that human beings always distribute some aspect of their cognitive activity activities necessarily because you you cannot use only the internal resources of your brain and so this was at least uh, in the case of our ancestors there are some good research in, paleo, in cognitive paleoanthropology that show this uh, problem of the fact that the mind, I use the, 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 the word mind to uh, mean the internal waves uh, of uh, processing cognition, was in realtà fecundated by the external representation and some new uh, discoveries, not only in science, but already at the level of uh, our ancestors, uh, some novelties, some, for instance, the, uh, the example of uh, the paleoanthropologist uh, Mitten is uh, the concept of a supernatural being. That is one of the first abstract concept of hum invented by human beings. In that case, the paleoanthropologist says this uh, discovery, this innovation, this new concept needed an external representation because without an external presentation, the mind was, uh, so to say, in a vicious circle. So this is, in my opinion, I, I, I agree, both with the distributed, distributed cognition tradition and the cognitive niches tradition, uh, uh, I agree that, that the, the, this, is it. This, this is absolutely typical of human beings. Consider that also Andy Clark uh, recently analyzed the role of language as a cognitive niches. He says, as a scaffolding, a kind of tool that can scaffold thoughts without, uh, imagine without uh, human language and, and not, not only speech, written human language. Uh, imagine it, it is impossible to scaffold thoughts, to organize thoughts. So this is another kind of important cognitive niche. In this case, I'm for, I am quoting Andy Clark, that is the father of the, the, the extended mind, you know, because there is not only the distributed cognition, there is also the extended mind, the embodied mind, and so on. But anyway, the, the, the important is to, to stress this interplay between internal and external that is related also to cognitive niches. Mm. Thank you very much. Let's uh, uh, continue this discussion uh, during the breakout rooms. Uh, we have we have to move on to the next speakers. Thank you very much, uh, Lorenzo, for your very interesting thanks talk. To, thanks uh, to the people that uh, attended my presentation and thanks for the questions. Our, our next speaker is uh, Celine Arfini. I don't know if I said that correctly, Ar Arfini. Uh, but so she is a, a student uh, of uh, uh, Lorenzo Magnani and she is a researcher in philosophy of science and an adjunct professor in cognitive philosophy at the Department of Humanities of the philosophy section of the University of Pavia in Italy. And she is also a member of the computational philosophy laboratory. And um, she wrote a paper together with Lorenzo for uh, the special issue uh, that she has been co-editing also on uh, the ultimate alt artifact language, the ultimate, ultimate artifact to build, develop, and update worldviews. And also together with uh, Alherson Pinilos, who is also here in the audience. Uh, uh, and so Celine is going to give the talk. Please go ahead. Thank you so much for this kind of introduction and thank you for um inviting us to discuss our paper in these uh, fantastic meetings. I'll try to uh, share my screen now. 
Okay. Now you should see the presentation. I think so. I hope so. I'm not sure. We okay. do. We do. Fantastic. Uh, I uh, I need to uh, say that I have some problem with uh, some problems with my uh, microphone and camera camera. So uh, if you don't um, hear me talk anymore, or uh, if you don't see my my image on uh, on the uh, camera. I, I did not disappear. I just had uh, some trouble. Please interrupt me anytime. I might uh, not be, I may not be um, aware of this problem. Okay, so um, to start with the presentation, as uh, you said, Natalie, um, co authors of this paper are Lorenzo and uh, Alger, Lorenzo Magnani and Alger Sanspinellos, a uh, chief and member together with me of the Computational Philosophy Laboratory at the University of Pavia. They are going to participate uh, with me to the Q&A uh, part of the webinar. And uh, I hope they are going to intervene if I say something terribly wrong uh, during the presentation or if they want to add uh, something at the end of it. So, to begin with the actual presentation, I think we, I can, uh, um, I think that a good place to start uh, is to focus on the main question, which we tackled in our paper. So, what role does language play in the process of building worldviews? We approach this question starting from a general discussion regarding the title of Topoi's special issue, which indeed spins around these two complicated topics, worldview and worldviews and language. Of course, though, uh, while we address this complicated first question, uh, other emerged as a problematic addition. For example, what exactly is a worldview? or uh, um, how should we approach the concept of language? Or uh, what kind of relations uh, um, our language and our worldviews form a shape? So since the more we thought about uh, this, uh, question, this first question, the more others would come up to our attention, we chose to limit our investigation using some conceptual tools. Indeed, uh, we frame our investigation and uh, consider language from an epistemological, ecological, and cognitive pers perspective, or using an ecocognitive epistemological approach. Ecocognitive epistemology is a formula created by Lorenzo to describe this investigation, which aims, which aims sorry, at understanding how agent, agents adapt to occupy or exploit uh, their, their environment, modifying their features and creating useful artifacts. So starting from this general perspective, we uh, consider language as an artifact. So as a man-made tool, which we use in various ways to reach different goals. Among these goals, we focus on how agents uh, use language um, to frame their uh, perceptual and conceptual points of view, which is the simplest way uh, we found uh, to describe uh, our worldview. So let's proceed uh, step by step. Here I will uh, present a condensed outline of this presentation. So starting from a definition of worldview, I will distinguish it from the notion of cosmovision, describing the former as a, um, a physical perspective and the latter as a more complex one. Then I will discuss the importance of, uh, in this regard, of two other terms that instead come from the semi-physical uh, theory created by the mathematician René, René Tom, saliences and pregnancies. These terms will allow us to discuss in which way agents can uh, put into focus what emerges, what emerges uh, to their attention as significant data. Then I will draw a connection between the idea of uh, saliences and pregnancies and uh, worldviews and cosmovisions by describing language, language as the tool 
that allows us to recognize, approach, explain, and use the relevant data we find in our environment. So last note uh, on uh, the presentation, I need to confess that uh, in order to keep uh, the presentation brief uh, and with limited jargon, I will not discuss in depth some aspects of our research, such as, for example, the holistic approach to knowledge we adopted and the importance of abduction and affordances in our discussion, or the um, uh, importance of the extended mind uh, thesis for our hypothesis. If, however, uh, you're interested in um, you're interested to find out uh, how these uh, pieces of the puzzle fall together to enrich our framework, please feel free to ask uh, questions about them in the Q and A part of this uh, um, of this presentation. So let's begin by the distinction uh, between cosmovisions and worldviews. So we borrow, uh, borrowed part of this distinction from the pragmatist, pragmatist tradition, in particular from William James empiricism, which we also in part embrace and uh, which he characterized this way. Empiricism lays the explanatory stress upon the part, the element, the individual, and treats the whole as a collection and the universal as an abstraction. It is essentially a mosaic philosophy, a philosophy of plural facts. In this paper on empiricism, um, James used the word Weltanschauung, Bel that we literally translated to cosmovision, to refer to an intellectualized attitude toward life. And uh, this attitude derived from uh, both cultural fact factors and conceptualized data that come from physical experience. From the distinction of these parts, so cultural factors and conceptualized data, we use the word worldview to put into focus our perceptual and conceptual experience. So by worldview, we mean the complex of data that comes from, uh, from our senses and from our tendency to infuse the data with conceptual meaning. So our worldview allows us to see, in a way, between the lines, color, and depths, particular and actual objects, while cosmovision refers to the um, agent's more abstract representation of the world, which is sociocultural, and so come from group efforts uh, to which the agents um, both participate to and are subjected to. So recognizing objects also allows us to perform what Hildebrand uh, calls double mutual anticipation, which is the notion that describes how agents act with other agents on the prediction of others' behavior mirroring their predictions and relative behavior. So the double mutual anticipation becomes how agents infer uh, similarities between theirs and others' worldviews. And from this interaction, a cosmovision emerges as a group effort on the ground of everyone's worldviews. So in a way, we can say that a worldview emerges when we see books uh, as conceptualized object taken from perceptual data. So when we move from step one to step two, the cosmovision instead emerges when for such a cultural factor, we recognize a library when we see a collection of book, silence and people reading. So asking what role does language play in the process of building worldviews means asking how we go from step one to step two, using language, or how language, how language allows us to perceive objects with a contextual meaning that is not culture-based or part of our cosmovision. Uh, so it is not asking how we, uh, we know that uh, in, um, in the second picture we are looking at books, but uh, 
is asking how we can perceive books as objects distinct from all the others. So in this regard, the, the question is actually doubled. First, we should ask, uh, how do we perceive contextual objects? So how do we um, not only contextualize, but uh, uh, conceptualize objects, perceptual data? And to how that language favor this process of, of contextualization. Of course, there are many answers that we could have provided for the first questions, for the first question. But we chose to maintain a pragmatist perspective on it using a sign-focused approach that is expressed in the uh, complex semi-physical theory of mathematician Renéton. Indeed, the sign in the pragmatist tradition uh, inaugurated by uh, Charles Sanders Peirce are feelings, images, conception, and other representation that affect the agents and make them produce inferential activities. In the semi-physical uh, theory, signs are uh, described in the same way even if uh, they are also associated to more uh, specific notions. So the concept of saliences and pregnancies. In particular, salient forms are sensorial uh, discontinuities that stand out in the environment for particular agents. If a point on a branch stands out because the rest, uh, sorry, for the, from the rest, because something moves, a quick recognition of this movement can determine the survival of the agents who sees it and identifies it as, for example, another branch shaken by the wind or the slithering of a snake, or in this case, as the Cheshire cat, cat. So these continuities in the external environment are then translated into other discontinuities in the individual sensorial state. These internal discontinuities are called pregnancies. Pregnancies are signals emitted and received by salient forms. When a salient form captures a pregnancy, it presents inner uh, modification, which can, in turn, deliver outward expression in its form. For example, curiosity or fear are pregnancies that uh, um, the salient form, Alice, can capture when she sees the Cheshire cat. I'm sorry, I, I picked out this, uh, this example, but I cannot pronounce so uh, well uh, Cheshire cat. I will try again. Anyway, uh, of course, obtaining a sensitivity to salient forms and pregnancies happens not only at the, an instinctual level, but also through appropriate artifacts, which work as uh, pregnancy mediators. Indeed, for example, when a bell ring rings and the sound is repeated frequently enough along with the present along with the presentation of meat to a dog because of pavlovian conditioning the nutrition pregnancy of the meat spread to the salient form which is the auditive system uh, of the dog when the conditioning is built up the bell alludes symbolically to the meat and symbolically is uh, the key word here because at this point we are already considering the role of language in mediating pregnancies through salient form and so our uh, language allows the process of building developing and updating agents worldviews indeed we agree with recent studies in distributed cognition that contend that vocal and written languages are basically cognitive tools are just uh, as i will um, i will present uh, um, pregnancy mediators since they foster and favor cognitive activities of the agents andy clark for example sees the brain the brain as a pattern completing device and language as an external instrument, as an, in, an external tool which promotes this cognitive talent. And as a tool that favors um, pattern completing activities, 
uh, language tunes up agents' worldview to accept the changes and anomalies of the environment. This way, agents' reflections on the context is continuously updated. Moreover, uh, language is culturally transferred from one generation to the next just by exposing the individual to samples of it. That at least samples that uh, afterward can be generalized in, uh, in the um, cosmovisions of the agents. So for, from a non-genetic perspective, human language enters the scene of the agent world building, uh, world, uh, world view building, since their first interaction between human infants, uh, babies, and their parents and uh, caregivers. Indeed, at first they communicate with each other with uh, gesture, uh, faces, forms, but also special cries. And later, those special cries transform, and the infants enter what we can call a linguistic semiosic, semiosis, sorry, learning and using words that modify their, mean of inter their means of interaction and their worldview. The infant indeed capture a lot of words when interacting with uh, uh, caregivers and parents. And only, only some of those word, words are actually pregnant, transmit something meaningful to him. So the mother, while speaking, emanates an amount of her pregnancies using contact, contact or pointing fingers, thus connecting a given object or an event to the sound of a particular word. In the baby, internalization of this word occur in, occurs in, term, in terms of neural fixation. And uh, so it learns, he learns the contextual meaning of objects and its worldview expands. From a phylogenetic point of view, instead, language, of course, can not only help the agents uh, build, uh, build complex worldviews, but also allows them to shape up shared cosmovisions. To make a very um, silly example, if I tell you that uh, I think someone is a brick and you trust me, so you perceive what I'm saying as meaningful. In other, word, in other words, I emit a pregnancy that you can capture. Then you will see that person that I call the prick as a prick too, even before speaking to him, just because you trust me and uh, this modifies a bit your perspective of uh, this person, on, of this person, your, um, worldview that involves this person. To make a more complex example, language can convey organizational message to the member of a group sending directions regarding the execution of various tasks. Basically, politics uh, is all about well-targeted pregnancies. So, this is basically how we answered the main question of the article. Language in our, account, in our account is the ultimate artifact that by interacting um, on the agent's conceptualization of object, by um, favoring that conceptualization, allows them to build, develop, and update their worldview and uh, contextual meaning of what they know. At the same time, by spreading appro appropriate pregnancies to other agents, language has also a strong impact on how we shape up and develop our shared cosmovisions. So it has both a biological and a cultural role in the generation of our perspective. So this was our more or less, actually very more or less, as I said, I cut out some, um, some parts of our paper just to, uh, to make a brief presentation instead of a too long one. 
but uh, um, we are still working on uh, some of these um, of these topics. This was our contribution to uh, the top of a special issue on uh, language and worldviews, but uh, um, we are still uh, wondering, for example, if um, how shared cosmovisions allow uh, the emergence of a strange phenomena as a pluralistic ignorance, for example, or how different bodies embed different perspectives and uh, the ground, uh, it's uh, paradoxical, almost paradoxical, but is the same shared cosmovision. So how particular worldview uh, can uh, coexist in the same cosmovision. Uh, so since the work is still ongoing, any comments or question will be much appreciated. At this point, if Lorenzo or, or Alger want to say something, I will leave the floor to them. If not, I leave you with a bit of uh, literature in the last slide, and I thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Celine. Uh, Lorenzo and Alger, do you do you want to comment? Lorenzo, your sound is off. Oh. Wait, wait, Lorenzo, you, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, maybe in the discussion, not now. Okay. Alger, do you want to say something? Only only thank you to Selene because the presentation is perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much, Celine. Are there other uh, questions from the audience? It's a lot to think about because it's, of course, uh, the presentation of a paper, so it's very well researched. And um, in fact, yeah, the, in that regard, a question that I have is you talked about James and um, uh, there is this very strong connection in Germany. We're thinking about the concept of a world unshowing. Um, and in that regard, uh, what is the connection with Kant according to you? <laughs> according to you, what is the connection there with Kant? I need to uh, refer to Alger just because he uh, insists on uh, uh, the word uh, cosmovision because it uh, reflected the word Weltanschauung and uh, I would feel bad to answer uh, to, uh, to this question instead of him. Yes, the, the idea to translate uh, worldview as cosmovision is the idea to take benefit of Weltanschauung in relation of the worldview as Umwelt from the That's semiotic, semiotic Luxo, point of view. Yeah. Mm -hmm. is, is this, this idea? If you can take benefit of, of Umwelt as perception, then you can postulate a uh, worldview as, as Weltanschauung. It's to complete the semiotic and pragmatic point of view. It was an uh, idea. I don't know if it's, if it's good or not, <laughs> but, but this is the connection. The real connection is with perception and, and Umwelt. In this, in this case, from the language point of view, it's possible to connect with, with language games uh, by Wittgenstein and so on, but it's very difficult if you want to, to take benefit of Wittgenstein in a paper about uh, pragmatism. You need to, to add a lot of information. It's very difficult to work with Wittgenstein. And for this reason, we decide to, to play with William James taking benefit only with uh, its conception of belt and sound only in this in this way yeah because of course um, he never talked about umwelt of course yeah yeah are there questions from the audience perhaps the question there also and and this this also can go to lorenzo for example is the question of of uh, metaphysical monism and pluralism and uh, the idea of a worldview or worldviews, how many are there out there? And what does that mean? Uh, 
if I can answer, or Lorenzo was uh, already prepared to, to answer. No, you have to answer, Selene, okay. about metaphysics. I am oh. a neopositivist. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, I, I also embrace a more, um, well, empiricism is a good, uh, is a good term to, uh, to, to describe what uh, I, I ground my beliefs in, my theoretical beliefs in. But I think that uh, the question of pluralism is about uh, concordance, is about how uh, a pluralistic view can uh, uh, put together different uh, worldviews. So, for example, the problem of uh, understanding worldviews as uh, embedded uh, in a biological and physical perspective is that uh, we don't have the same bodies. We have different bodies and uh, with different bodies come different perspectives. And at the same time, we uh, need a common uh, a common view of the world, a common uh, share, a shared uh, culture, a shared uh, society and so on. So we need to put different uh, uh, worldviews together and in a way uh, cancel differences and uh, um, delete some of the uh, differences between all the worldviews. So the plural, the problem of plurality of worldviews is really a uh, a problem of, uh, we, we don't accept the plurality of cosmovisions. We don't accept the plurality that the world is uh, culturally very different from, from people, from person to person. This is, uh, I'm sorry, I, I should have started with that. This is just my opinion. And so it's uh, highly con contestable, it's highly, uh, you can argue about it. There is, uh, there is uh, nothing in, uh, in, the, in, the words, uh, in the works of, um, of James or uh, yeah, from empiricists that, uh, that says uh, the same. But uh, I think the, the problem of plurality and uh, plurality of uh, worldview is truly important. But uh, I think it's uh, a matter for another paper or research, maybe. But so the plurality of worldviews, but one world. Yeah. JT also has a question. Oh, thank you. And congratulations to the panel on what I think is the most beautiful PowerPoint presentation I've ever seen, uh, including the Alice in Wonderland pictures. And I thought the pronunciation of Cheshire Cat was excellent. I put a question in, in the chat. <clears throat> I heard last week an interview with an author called Annie Murphy Paul, the panel may know. She has a new book called The Extended Mind. Uh, I am not familiar with, with Andy Clark's much of his work. I haven't read it myself. So thank you for those references, especially that quote from his 1997 about language as a tool in my current book based on uh, encyclopedia articles of mine, including Encyclopedia of Creativity. I propose that all units of culture, not just language, but music and uh, vehicles and anything we can think of, every domain in culture, science, the arts, social science is a tool uh, for solving problems. So I must indeed follow up on Andy, uh, Andy Clark's work. Thank you for that. And um, ah, somebody, yes, Lorenzo has answered this practically the same idea. Okay, good. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. I look forward to reading the article. Are these out now, these articles in Topoi? Or sorry, are, I missed that. They are already they are. online as online first. So, so most papers are, in fact, all papers are, are uh, online uh, except Diana who is uh, in the proofing stage. So that will be online uh, any day. And then I, I am I'm finalizing my paper. <laughs> I'm still writing it, <laughs> which is like the privilege, you know, of, of like editing. Are you last? Yeah, I'm team? always the last. I'm always the last. It's, it's normal. Uh, yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> okay. Yes, mm -hmm. very interesting. I think with human universals across different cultures, 
there must be indeed a great overlap in people's worldviews, but at the same time, different cultures promote very different worldviews. Um, those extraneous worldview or parts of a worldview that that uh, William J you had the William James quote there about each one is a part of a worldview, a, a, a mosaic, I think it was called. Um, some of those obviously overlap in, in books like Donald Brown's Human Universals, and yet there are worldviews uh, extraneous to that. In my book, I'm taking Popper one step further. He has the three worlds of products, the world of mental ideas and the world of abstract ideas, which sort of gets into Platonism. I add in processes as well. I, I often wonder how many people think of their worldviews in terms of how many different parts are in this. What does the panel think of Popper's three worlds uh, philosophy? Could I, could I throw that question out? Um, it's a lot. <laughs> I, don't know. I mean, it's uh, it's a question with uh, with a lot of questions in there. Um, if um, okay, if I can focus on just one of them, uh, it's very interesting the idea of uh, an abstract world, uh, which. Uh, I'm not sure is the same for everyone. I'm not sure I'm a very platonic scholar here, but uh, it's interesting to think about that um, we need uh, an abstract world, an abstract framework in which uh, we can say at least uh, that uh, your idea of freedom, for example, is like my idea of freedom. We need uh, the reassurance of uh, saying, okay, it's almost the same. That's why I'm suspicious by, suspicious, by the way, of the ethicizers, because it basically says that uh, our morality can, works for, can work for everyone and uh, that uh, we can have a shared morality without conflict, without uh, uh, discussing and uh, arguing about it. I don't know though, I, I just uh, heard about that uh, um, before when you mentioned it, but uh, I'm just suspicious of it and I want to know more just to make, maybe become less suspicious of it, I don't know. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, um, I, I thought about the, the problem of the universal when I, I read a bit of literature on the, um, on the theory of emotion. Basically, in the 90s and uh, 80s, uh, uh, there was um, a, a theory of emotion that uh, is still uh, rampant today, which says that we basically share uh, the same emotion and now uh, we all uh, look the same when we, for example, are angry or we're, when we are sad and so on. So this was one of possible uh, of a possible um, universal that uh, all humans share. Actually, when they uh, did some empirical research on it, uh, and uh, they um, find out, uh, find out, found out a lot of biases that uh, previous research had they discovered that uh, many of these uh, uh, emotional expressions are very different from culture to cultures. And uh, more the cultures were different, more the expressions were different. So that, that universal is no longer an actual universal, at least for uh, uh, the uh, research on uh, emotional the or emotion theory. So when, uh, when just to connect again uh, to the uh, question of Natalie on uh, on a plurality of worldview and with just one world. Well, since we express even our emotion differently and since uh, we need to connect to others from what we know, we need to at least postulate the fact that uh, there are one more, uh, one more worldview than what we expect to be. So there is a plurality of worldview as uh, if, the, if we think that there is at least one, there are at least two and so on. If there is at least two, there are at least three and so on. I don't know if I, 
uh, sorry, I just focused on one question, but I left a lot of uh, um, matter for others to discuss uh, in, uh, in this panel. Yeah, but that's, oh, that's the, great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, 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 that is also a bit of the question, eh? like like when you say eventually you recognize multiple worldviews, but then with this question of universals, it's the idea that from all these worldviews, somehow there is like a core that there is some kind of psychic unity that, that Kant, for example, thought about, or that there is eventually a, 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 a universal, but it's still a worldview. But then of how many worlds? You know, and then you already are talking about three entities. You have the world as it is in and of itself, one universal worldview that is like shared by all, and then the different worldviews. So that's already three. And then of course, yeah, JT, you're talking about Popper's three worlds, but that, that's that's a, another discussion altogether. But um, and I I I actually go further and I say like multiple worlds in 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 um, there's something that I've been developing, but you are one world. I like this uh, this version very much, if I may I say. <laughs> no, I need to think about it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nobody has an answer, right? So Especially also... given the hollow biont, right? Because we are all a planet full of alien life forms. Oh, yeah, that, that is yeah, that is that is another issue. Eh? There, <laughs> there, for example, if you look at the hollow biont, you can you can see that as an ecology and as a world in in and of itself. And then the question is, is that world inside another world? And you know, you, you can, how many worlds, you know, you can go at infinitum if you want, and it also needs to end eventually. But uh, where do you draw the line? Eh? That is the, <laughs> the question of ages. That's like, we're not gonna fix it today. Uh, Lorenz, do you want to say something? No. no. Yeah. No, no. Yeah, so yeah, we're, we're not going to fix it today, but this was a very interesting uh, uh, talk, Celine, thank you very much, and also a very interesting paper, and uh, Alger and Lorenzo, thank you very much for, for writing it, also thank you for co-editing, it was also a pleasure uh, to do that, and so now, uh, thank you very much, we will move on to the, the next speaker, who is uh, Barbara, uh, Barbara Jimenez Pazos. Barbara is a lecturer at the philosophy department at the University of the Basque Country. And uh, she is also associated to the Faculty of Education, Philosophy and Anthropology in San Sebastian. And she is a member of the EIS Research Center for Life, Mind and Society. And uh, she recently organized uh, as the executive uh, secretary, the International Ontology Congress, which was an amazing conference, which is under the patronage of UNESCO. And it was founded by, by people uh, such as uh, Ilya Prigozhin and all. I think she knows much more about it than me. So, um, I, I, um, uh, but so and it was an amazing conference and um, uh, she does that. And she has also been working with uh, Gregory Radic and with Michael Rose. And she uh, uh, was also present at the language uh, uh, seminar that we did, Language Over the Ages. And there she uh, won the prize of the best presentation of the postdoctoral uh, researcher at that time that she was. Now she moved on to be a lecturer. And so she wrote a paper on Darwin Puzzle, the computer assisted analysis on language in the origin of species. And she's going to present that paper today. Barbara. Thank you so much, Natalie. Can you see my presentation? We can, we can see it, yes. Okay, nice. Uh, thank you so much for your introduction and thank you organizers for designing such a wonderful series of, of webinars. Um, here is my title. Darwin puzzled, uh, computer assisted analysis of language and the origin of species. This is going to be a talk about a paper which has been recently published in Topoi Journal. Now, let me, to begin with, let me tell you a little bit about the, the origin of, of this paper, which goes back to the Protolang 6 satellite band ideas on language throughout the ages, which uh, took place at the University of Lisbon back in 2019. There I presented the main ideas included in, in this paper. 
And after the event, the organizers uh, designed a very nice um, special issue proposal for Topo Journal. This was the language and worldviews, ideas on language throughout the ages. And of course, I prepared um, a paper for this special issue because it was based on the Portland 6 satellite event. And uh, it was published back in June 2021, I think. And you can have a look at the paper at my personal website, or you can write an email to me and I can send the paper as an attachment. And all I want to say is um, thank you organizers of Protoline 6 satellite event because um, uh, for, uh, thank you precisely for organizing this special issue because otherwise um, this paper wouldn't have existed. So to begin with, um, let me tell you something about the what, how, and why, which is the big panorama uh, in which uh, my paper is inserted. This uh, will be like a kind of abstract, okay? A general abstract of the whole talk and the whole paper. Uh, so what? Um, the aesthetically optimistic last paragraph of Darwin's On the Origin of the Species contrasts with the evidence in his autobiography of a supposed perceptive colorblindness to the magnificence of nature. But now I ask, is there really a contrast? Well, to know this, we must delve into Darwin's perception of natural beauty and analyze it within the framework of the Viverian concept of the disenchantment of the world. How am I going to do this? Well, I have carried out a computer assisted study of Darwin's lexicon, focusing precisely on the frequency of aesthetic, emotional, and religious adjectives and adverbs in the six editions of The Origin of Species. Why? Well, my aim has been to extract underlying onto epistemological presuppositions about nature and the perception of its beauty. Well, this is the everybody is happy except Darwin is light. Here is a um, happy flower asking what's wrong. And here is uh, Darwin saying, oh, I'm, I am like a man who has become colorblind. So my main objective has been to answer to the question, was Darwin disenchanted? And so unravel the secrets of the relationship between, on the one hand, Darwin's scientific view of nature, and on the other hand, his perception of natural beauty. So here is the last paragraph of The Origin of His Species, where Darwin says that there is grandeur in this view of life, in his view of life, with endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful. Well, this is an aesthetically inspiring paragraph, isn't it? And besides, this is a disenchanted paragraph because Darwin doesn't need to resort to supernatural entities to explain the mechanisms he has already explained in the origin of the species. And still he perceives beauty and wonderfulness in nature. But we come across with this paragraph in his autobiography, and he says that I well remember my conviction that there is more in man than the mere breath of his body. This is a memory from his youth in the, in the Beagle in South America. But now he says, the grandest scenes would not cause me any such convictions and feelings to rise in my mind. It may be truly said that I am like a man who has become colorblind. This is a paragraph uh, extracted from a chapter in his autobiography where he also says that he progressively lost his religious beliefs. So this might be a clue. And 
Well, he says that he diagnoses this, this problem, this, let's say, as a loss of perception. This is in page 76 in this edition of, of his autobiography. But later on, in page 113, he continues saying things like, I have tried lately to read Shakespeare and found it so intolerably dull that it nauseated me. I've also lost my taste for pictures or music. I retain some taste for fine scenery, but it does not cause me the exquisite delight which it formerly did. Why this should have caused the atrophy of that part of the brain alone on which the higher aesthetic tastes depend, I cannot conceive. My mind seems to have become a kind of machine for grinding general laws out of large collections of facts. This curious and lamentable loss of the higher aesthetic tastes is all the other as books on history, biographies, and travels, independently of any scientific facts which they may contain, and essays on all sorts of subjects interest me as much as they did. Well, Darwin's language indicates sorrow and puzzlement. Now I ask, is it possible that Darwin faced with his turmoil could have misinterpreted first his perceptive color blindness, second, his loss of the higher aesthetic tastes, and third, his cerebral atrophy. Well, I think that the concept of the disenchantment of the world by Max Weber is a good way to rephrase. Darwin's problem. But what does disenchantment mean? Well, Max Weber, in his Science as a Vocation text, says, we are not ruled by mysterious, unpredictable forces. We can, in principle, control everything by means of calculation. So according to Max Weber, in the process of intellectualization and rationalization in the modern cultural world, technology and calculation are the main explanatory supports for the conditions in which we live. And the acceptance of this fact is the seed of the disenchantment of the world and consequently of feelings of emotional helplessness caused by the weakening of religion. Here are some questions I have asked to connect Darwin with this enchantment. Both Darwin's symptoms and diagnosis could fit with Bavarian disenchantment, perhaps caused by Darwin's assimilation of his own theory and a subsequent loss of the meaning of life. That said, how is it possible that Darwin and the origin with a message both of intellectual and aesthetic emotional satisfaction, whilst it isn't allegedly until years later that he experiences pernicious symptoms for the appreciation of natural and artistic magnificence. So was it Darwin's disenchanted view of nature that led him to believe he was colorblind when looking at magnificent natural landscapes? And ultimately, is this enchantment compatible with aesthetic experience and sensitivity in nature? Well, my hypothesis is that the progressive acquisition of scientific explanatory knowledge of nature shaped the ontological and epistemological presuppositions on which Darwin's conception of nature was founded in such a way that, as a consequence, he would have adopted a disenchanted conception. Nevertheless, I think that disenchantment need not necessarily have weakened Darwin's aesthetic sensitivity, but just the opposite, strengthened it. As we can gather from the aesthetic, emotionally satisfied view of life, that Darwin describes at the end of the origin. 
how could we test this hypothesis? Well, the analysis of the lexical evolution of descriptions of natural objects, processes, laws, mechanisms, etc., in the six editions of the origin should reveal the corresponding onto-epistemological presuppositions of Darwin's understanding of the world. And the semantic testimony of the lexicon of the origin should have more authority than Darwin's own opinion about his aesthetic sensitivity in his autobiography. The tool used in my methodology is text analysis aided by the software package Warsmith tools. Firstly, I have processed the texts of the six editions of the origin of species with a tool world list to obtain world frequency lists, which are useful for comparing the frequency of usage of keywords in the different editions. And the terminology chosen for analysis has been, on the one hand, adjectives and adverbs of an aesthetic sentimental tenor, like admirable or beautifully, because the semantic analysis of these terms should reflect Darwin's capacity for experiencing aesthetic sensations in nature. And second, adjectives of a potentially religious, spiritual, magical, or mystical tenor, like divine or miraculous, because the absence or presence of this type of lexicon should be a determinant aspect of the degree of enchantment or disenchantment on which Darwin establishes his theories. And secondly, the selected aesthetic sentimental and religious adjectives and adverbs have been processed using the tool Concord, which is useful for locating a certain term in the lexical and semantically analyzing the surrounding lexicon. The comprehensive development of this computer assisted methodology should solve the dilemma as to whether the acceptance of evolutionist principles led Darwin to adopt a disenchanted view of nature, intellectually and aesthetically more valuable, as I propose in the hypothesis, or weakened, as Darwin suggests in his autobiography. So here are the results of an analysis of the lexicon across the six editions of the origin of the species. On your left, you have the complete occurrences, the complete results of aesthetic sentimental adjectives and adverbs across editions. And on your right, you have the complete results of religious adjectives across editions. These are only lexical results. The most important part of this analysis comes when we semantically analyze these terms. In other words, when we locate these terms in context. We don't have much time today to, to comment all these terms, but um, please note the frequency, the high frequency of adjectives like admirable, beautiful, extraordinary, extraordinarily, and wonderful on the part of the aesthetic sentimental, sentimental adjectives and adverbs. And besides their high frequency, please note the increasing growth of adjectives across editions. On the other hand, we have a very low frequency of potentially religious adjectives. And besides that, please note the irregular tendency of these, um, of these adjectives. No adverbs have been found. Uh, for a complete semantic analysis, you can go to, to, my, to my paper. But today, we will only analyze a couple of examples, like the terms affected by the adjective wonderful from the first 
to the third edition of the origin of species, Darwin applies wonderful to this list of elements like difference in beaks, development, fact, the structure, power of sense, metamorphosis in function, instinct, please note the high frequency of instinct, so on and so forth. And from the fourth edition on, Darwin incorporates a new list of elements or aspects of nature like these, like differing manner, cases, difference between workarounds and perfect females, thickness, changes of structure, so on and so forth. And the same, more or less the same, happens with the adjective beautiful. From the first to the third edition of the origin of the species, Darwin applies beautiful to blue color, races of plants, co-adaptations, adaptations, diversity and proportion of kinds, males, so on and so forth. And from the fourth edition on, he again incorporates a new list of elements and aspects of nature like crystalline lens, organic beings, objects, balut and corn shells, productions of nature, male animals, so on and so forth. So once I have analyzed semantically these results, my conclusion is that Darwin's aesthetic sentimental sympathy falls for nature's most essential or constitutive aspects such as the structural, adaptive, adaptive functional, instinctive, or factual qualities that define a great variety of living beings. Darwin values above all the beauty of technical complexity, adaptive excellence, and the diversity of natural mechanisms, such as how wonderful it is for his intellectual delight to know that natural instincts of a complex biological functionality can be seen with rigorous precision in animal behavior. And the increasing focus on these aspects is only possible due to the growing expansion, I think, of his scientific technical knowledge. But now we're going to have a brief look at the religious um, results. These are only a few examples, but as a summary, I can, I can tell you that the vast majority of references to uh, religious adjectives in the origin of the species, in the six editions of the origin of the species, belong to the bibliographic list. In other words, these terms are part of other authors' works. Like down there, you see divine love, divine elements, holy altar, holy places. These belong to the bibliographic list. And some other terms are quotations. Darwin includes of other authors like divine power, mystical natural philosophy, what is supernatural or miraculous. So quotations or bibliographic list. This means that Religious objectives are not part of the theoretical core in Darwin's um, explanations in the origin of species. So Darwin doesn't need, doesn't use religious objectives to explain what he needs to explain in the origin of species. So Darwin use of language reflects a Latin disenchantment understanding of nature. And this is precise, precisely reflected in his admiration for the complexity of natural phenomena, which he can explain through merely natural causes. So despite Darwin's idea of nature being sustained by disenchanted onto epistemological assumptions, his aesthetic experience not, not only doesn't lack emotional intensity, but becomes perceptibly 
more complex, as we have seen in the semantic analysis of sentimental and aesthetic adjectives and adverbs. So what happened in his later years? This is an extended version of the paragraph extracted from his autobiography. Um, Darwin says, formally, I was led by feelings such as those just referred to, to the firm conviction of the existence of God and of the immortality of the soul. I well remember my conviction that there is more in man than the mere breath of his body. This is a memory from his, from his youth in the Beagle. But now, the grand scenes would not cause me any such convictions and feelings to rise in my mind. It may be truly sad that I am like a man who has become colorblind. The state of mind which grand scenes formerly excited in me and which was intimately connected with a belief in God did not essentially differ from that which is often called the sense of sublimity. Uh -huh. So what happened? Um, if, according to Darwin, his belief in God was closely linked to a perception of the grandeur of nature, thus creating a classical experience of the sublime, it is understandable that he would attest to suffering color blindness, which is a defective perception of natural splendor, once his religious belief have been weakened. But it is striking that Darwin doesn't clarify that that which is really defective, the cause of his sensation of all blindness, is the theological link of these three points, perception of the beauty or magnificence of nature, belief in God, and experience of the sublime. He doesn't say that the problem is the second point, the belief in God, and not his capacity for perception. In general, I think that the mistake in Darwin's interpretation could be syllogistic since his mind appears to work in the following way. There is an aesthetic experience if in art or in nature, contents X, Y, Z are perceived. I can no longer perceive them. Therefore, I then don't have aesthetic sensitivity. This syllogism could have led Darwin to believe that similarly, he was suffering from a loss of the higher aesthetic tastes caused by a supposed partial cerebral atrophy. So if Darwin identifies natural beauty with the mark of the divine in nature and it stops establishing such a relationship given the ideological consequences derived from the assimilation of his theory of evolution, it is therefore plausible to accept that he believed he had lost at the same time the taste for music, poetry, landscaping, or painting, because these are arts which could equally let the reader, observer, or listener to experience feelings of religious exaltation. In summary, the loss of a perception of the divine in nature a consequence of the internalizing of a disenchanted understanding of nature made of course in Darwin a feeling of having lost his aesthetic sensitivity by mistake, I think. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Barbara, uh, for your talk. Uh, questions. Selena has a question. I need to say that I'm no expert in uh, uh, Darwin, Darwin uh, um, or uh, in um, 
I mean, I know the origin of the species, but uh, I don't uh, have an expert knowledge uh, regarding the history of the public the publication. So I was wondering if uh, um, the publisher uh, I, or if uh, you or the critics know if the publisher have uh, have suggested slight modification to the uh, to the editions in order to make them more hopeful or more appealing to uh, uh, the. And, it, it was just uh, um it just occurred to me that uh, it may be a way to uh, sorry I, I i lost um the sound um oh i'm so sorry i my microphone doesn't work it's completely no, 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 i possible. can hear you i can hear oh, you okay. yeah now i hear you oh i'm sorry, I'm and sorry. in very brief uh, it may be possible that uh, um the publisher suggested to Darwin to slightly modify the text in order to make them more appealing to the public more. Uh, so the, the recurrence of beautiful, of, of uh, wonderful and so on and so forth are just a way to make uh, more accepted the text instead of uh, a personal uh, adjustment of the editions. Uh, wow, that's uh, a very nice question. Um, I am aware that the publisher was somehow in uh, in conversation with with Darwin, and yeah, he he definitely the publisher uh, definitely suggested Darwin to modify the text uh, somehow, but I'm not sure whether these two talks about this in these terms. I'm not sure whether they, um, they talked about uh, including more references to, to beauty in order to, to, to become the, uh, in order to, yeah, make the, the text more readable or, yeah, you know what I mean? Uh, I am not sure about this. This is really nice. Um, uh, if somebody else has has an answer about this, um, because I know the publisher and Darwin uh, were in conversation to modify the text across editions, but I am not sure about about this specific part of your question. Uh, if somebody else has has something to say about this, I would really appreciate it. But thank you so much. This is a really nice question. Katie, you have a question. Sorry, yes, thank you. A great talk, thank you, Barbara. I really look forward to reading this article. Um, I wonder how much in, do you think, uh, in my understanding of, of reading about Darwin's life, it's, I could be wrong. My understanding was his greatest lack of faith or turning away from religion resulted from the death of his eldest daughter, Annie. Yeah. 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 Is, is that right? Where he, yeah. he became yeah. convinced that a benevolent God would never let something like that happen. Yeah. Yeah. Apart from, apart from his other observations influenced by Lyle and realizing he would look at a geological landscape when he came to Australia in 1836, I think on the Beagle, he looked at uh, the Blue Mountains range here and he could see the ancient craters where the oceans had formed the different landscapes. And he, he mentioned how when he now looked at a large landscape like that, he would only see the action of the sea over millennia and what that makes me think is in, in the way that our brain apparently you, you use it or lose it. And if you, you keep thinking in certain ways, those sort of scientific technological ways that he thought more and more and came to appreciate more with the, the beauty of adaptation, as you were saying, in the design of these, these elements, seems to me he, he may have gotten caught in 
in, in thinking like an engineer, <laughs> where an engineer tends to look at a, um, a car or something where one person might say, what a beautiful car that is without knowing how it was designed, how it worked, why it got that way. Whereas a designer would, would appreciate their worldview, you know, coming from the previous talk would be a complete developed in completely different sense in that that aesthetic feeling I too was struck by that passage where he said I I read Shakespeare and find it incredibly dull <laughs> and he seems to have lost his appreciation for the arts and literature and everything on that I won't say on that side of the brain because I'm not so sure that the, the right side is is drawing and, and visual aesthetics and the left side is purely linguistic and logical. That's, that's complex, of course, but he seems to, as you were saying, there's an atrophy perhaps as he gets older because he must have over-strengthened those parts of the brain that process the engineering of these natural artifacts and as a result lost the parts of the brain that can appreciate those more aesthetic qualities. Um, is, is that your basic premise in, in the article? Did I get that right? The, the, the gist of it was... Uh, yeah, this, well, this is basically his understanding of, of, of the problem. He, he says that his mind seems to have become a kind of machine for grinding general laws out of large collections of facts. Uh, he says, my mind is atrophied, yeah? So it's, it, there's something wrong with my mind. Yeah, he, he, he thinks that his mind stops working at some point of the perceiving of the beauty of nature. So yeah, th this is his understanding of the problem. Um, my view on this is that he, in his youth, he connected beauty in nature with religious feelings which is, this is the classical uh, concept of the sublime. But in, in his uh, later years, when he grew older, the God element, the religious element disappeared. So he has um, like a kind of sensation of having lost also the beauty, the, the, the capacity to perceive beauty in nature. But I think he has not lost this capacity. What, what is, is what is really gone is the element God out there. So, but he has a strange sensation. So, but this is only my 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 view on this. He might have, uh, yeah, he might have suffered from atrophy in his in his brain. Um, <laughs> we will never know. We will never know. Thanks very much for your your commentary. Thank you. David, David Suarez Pascal, you also have a question. Yeah, thank you, Natalie. And thank you, Barbara, for your presentation. Um, I, I want to ask something related to, to the issue which you were talking about. Um, it is more related to this kind of axiological or, or moral shift in 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 british society i think uh, related to to the view of nature that that darwin's work uh, was picturing um, I, I am thinking in lord tennyson uh, work in memoriam uh, where he describes this view of nature uh, as um wrap in, in tooth and claw and, and I, I find interesting that uh, I, I don't know if, if if this view is shared by Darwin but I I read Wallace uh, his work Darwinism and he 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 talks about this view of nature and, and he he says that um it is not so ugly it's not so so terrible to see such a uh, degree of destruction and and suffering in in nature because um 
that is uh, quick and there is no suffering in 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 in, in that um, because um, him he he is uh, comparing a human perception of of that and animal perception of of that and he says that um, we see suffering in 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 that and in nature because we anticipate that but that animals in in, in nature they just uh, become uh, weak and weaker and, and then die but they do not suffer because they don't anticipate uh, that uh, so um, i i want to ask you if if you if you see in in, in darwin's uh, language in, in in the different editions of of the origin this kind of change in the percept in in this perception of nature not just uh, but this this shift in in technical his technical appreciation appreciation of of adaptations or of the the way in, in which um organisms uh, relate to to the the, envir the environment but um uh, uh, this kind of change in a moral view of, of nature regarding uh, what is um, good uh, if this uh, destruction and suffering and com comp competence competency uh, is, is brings uh, a greater um, goodness in in the world or something like that which might be related to to the last paragraph of of the origin uh thank you so much i don't know if you, it is clear yeah more or less yeah um um as uh as far as i only focus on the issue of beauty and and let's say the aesthetic perception of nature across the six editions um i haven't focused my mind on the moral issue you are you are asking me so i don't have an answer to that but that's a very nice question and that's a very nice topic to to um to work on uh, which is um uh, as far as i as i know as in, and if i have properly understood your your question is to uh, focus on the moral view Darwin had across the six editions of the origin of the species, the moral view of nature, and to see whether this view evolved or changed across the years. Uh, have, I, have I understood it well? Um, yeah, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't. From from how from how many to to this new view? Um. Uh, that that is... Is, yeah. Um. Sadly, I don't have an answer because, uh, as I said, I've only focused on the aesthetic view of nature, but um. That would be um, yeah, a very nice topic to to do more research on. Yeah, I'm um, sadly I, I I don't have an answer. Okay, thank you. A lot of hard questions. Eh? Yeah, more questions. JT, a quick one. Barbara, I really like how you looked at the the closeness of the word to a uh, description of nature. I would love to see a similar analysis because I notice when I read Darwin of how he describes other people's work, he so often has a word such as an admirable work when, yeah. when he's praising other naturalists works. Did, yeah, exactly. did you happen to, you had to separate those out because every time he would say a wonderful work by so-and-so author, how, how much of the text is him praising author's works versus him praising nature? <laughs> yeah, um, uh, definitely. If you go to, to my paper, you will see it separated. So, he, yeah. Oh, 
<laughs> yeah, uh, well, not really separated, but I, I note that um, um, quite a lot of occurrences of the, of, for example, the term admirable refer to other people, to other people. Yes. So, so yeah, he's not referring to nature, but to to other people. So, yeah, this is this is uh, this is in the paper, but uh, for the sake of brevity, I I couldn't comment everything today. But but that's that's a nice that's a nice point. That's a nice point. Yeah. Thank you. It's all right. Thank you very much, Barbara, and uh, uh, thank you again to all three speakers um, uh, of the webinar. And so with this, we come at the end of, of um, uh, this uh, webinar, and I want to take the opportunity again to thank um, uh, Fabio for uh, hosting uh, our special issue in Topoi, which is truly an honor. And I want to thank Marta Facuti for having co-organized with me the workshop and for Protolang uh, uh, at the time, it was a satellite event for Protolang. And I want to, of course, thank uh, the authors for contributing. It's always a bit like the Oscars. I want to thank everybody. I'm very grateful, which I am. And I'm uh, especially also very grateful to uh, Diana Kuto, who could not be here. She is writing uh, the PhD right now, and she's in that phase that, you know, you can only write. Mathieu Fontaine, who uh, also co-edited, and he is teaching uh, Friday uh, on Friday, so he could not be present either. And then Lorenzo Magnani and Selena Arfini, uh, uh, who spoke today, and who were also uh, co-editing this special issue with me. And so I'm very grateful. And um, the issue will appear uh, sometime next year. Um, I am finalizing my paper and then we have to do the introduction, which will be quick. And then the papers will go online and then the, the issue will be published sometime next year, uh, in, in early next year uh, in Topoi. So uh, be on the lookout for that and thank you everybody. And so now I'm going to stop filming. Thank you, bye-bye. Um,